Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peter, and welcome to a presentation this time, which is very strange. Yes, uh, this time we're doing a presentation. Um, it's a presentation about my very favorite topic, uh, software craftsmanship. Now, um, if you know all about it, then by all means, feel free to skip this one. Uh, but if you do want a refresher or you've never heard about this, or you just want to be motivated, right? You'd maybe, maybe you're a developer and you're just getting tired and jaded and um, programming just isn't what it used to be, man. And, um, and it's all the new frameworks that ruined it for me uh, or, or, or whatever the case may be for you. Um, you're in the right place. It's probably better to watch uh, this video than some weird motivational video where the dude goes like jogging or you know lifts some weights because we're not lifting weights. Or maybe we kind of are, but the only weights that we're lifting is probably like compiler errors. And even then it deals mental damage, not physical damage. All right, so let's talk about software craftsmanship. What is craftsmanship? What is a craft? Craft is the other part of Minecraft. But what is a craftsmanship? Well, if you look um, at the image I have in the background, there is some guy. He's apparently married. He also has a cool watch. Um, he also has a workshop and he's cutting something for whatever reason. Now, um, I don't need to know his entire life story um, to be able to tell that um, he looks like a craftsperson. Um, how would you get that feeling? What, what is that feeling? I know it's not that it's like desaturated, it's like sapia colors. Um, I get a sense of neatness from him. I, lo I look at this and I'm like, okay, so you have like this board that has this checkered pattern that's very precise, right? Uh, you have your tools around. They're not neatly organized, but you still have them like ready. I imagine if there, th there's probably a wall behind him with like all his tools, you know, neatly organized. And he's probably not even focused on, um, you know, the nitty gritty, or maybe he is, um, of what he's doing, but he's probably working towards some other goal. He's maybe building a chair. I don't know why you would cut that piece of uh, whatever plastic thing uh, to make a chair, but maybe he, whatever, he's building something, right? Well, as a software developer, you're building something too. What are you building? Um, it doesn't really matter. It's, uh, well, I mean, it does matter what, what you're building, uh, but it also matters how you're building it. And so we're going to talk about this software craftsmanship thing. What if developing software could be a craft? What if you could approach it like a, like a carpenter approaches uh, making his new um, a cool item, right? So let's, let's uh, delve into it. Uh, enough preamble. So how is software developed? Well, Peter, that's an easy one. I open Visual Studio and I uh, type code. Okay, really? Or right, how is uh, software developed in a team? I don't know, Peter. I've never been in a team. Okay, good. Um, well, maybe maybe we should do some pair programming sometime. Um, from my experience, from looking around and from talking to you guys um, in our uh, Element chat, I know that uh, more often than not, it is a weird, hectic blame game full of uh, either people who are absolutely uh, apathetic, they just don't really uh, contribute at all, or they just contrib contribute the, the minimum, or it's people who are super excited and, and sort of burn out very quickly. It's basically not like a craftsman would approach, uh, I don't know, making a chair or whatever, right? Interesting. Uh, it's, that's um, that's an interesting fact to note. And I mean, feel free to answer this question for yourself. How is How do you develop software? Do you have an organized method? Do you have a set of tools that you kind of use? Or do you just like willy nilly one time get so depressed of your own life that you just open Visual Studio out of like, you know, guilt really type a bunch of lines before uh, getting bored and uh, watching YouTube videos. Um, and if you've done that right before this video, then I feel you. <laughs> Um, great, but let's, let's think about it from a slightly different perspective. Which one of these would you pick? Would you, would you pick a, a hard to change software that works right now or an easy to change one that doesn't work right now? Uh, imagine you're building your latest and greatest chat bot, right? Pe people really like, uh, their, their chat bots. So, um, 
Would you like to have one that's really difficult to change, but it works right now? Or an easy to change one that doesn't work? Um, you might be you might be tempted to say, oh, well, of course, the left one, right? Like, hard to change, I don't care, but it works, right? I need it to work. Um, well, hold on there, buckaroo, because while it might be nice to, to have it working, um, isn't it more important... Um, that you're able to easily change it so that you can develop the software, you can change, you can uh, grow it somewhere else. Maybe it's not finished. What if it's not finished? Would it change something? Um, another question, is software ever finished? Have you ever, you know, written that l last line of code and Visual Studio through confetti and congratulated you with a pop-up that says, you did it, software is done next software um, that that doesn't happen right so if we take into consideration the fact that software is never finished uh, doesn't it make more sense to then prefer software that is easy to change even if it means that it doesn't work right now because if it, it we don't care that it doesn't work if it's easy to change it's easy to fix but well, that's not that necessarily true right but it's going to be marginally more you know uh, or easier uh, to make uh, work than um, code that is just hard to change completely. All right, with that in mind, how it's done is as important as having it done. So if you sit there in a Visual Studio on one of those gloomy days with chalky milk and your uh, glimish live stream on another monitor looking at other developers being all productive and then you look back at your visual studio and it's just bad and it's all red and Rosalind is screaming in pain and you feel bad about yourself maybe you shouldn't maybe that guy has it I, w I don't want to say done because you know we just said that <laughs> the software isn't really done ever uh, maybe that uh, that guy is or girl doesn't matter um, is further in the development process but if you're doing it right, right? If you're if the if you master the how, you can feel you feel, you can feel good about that. Um, some people might say might object to that and be like, I don't care if you're like going by the book, and we we don't mean really going by the book with the how. That's the interesting. We'll we'll talk about that in just a bit. Uh, we're trying to address this um, weird sort of prejudice in a way where you prefer software that is like more advanced or uh, more feature rich um, when really does it does it really matter though um, well you, you could say well it does to the end customer to the people using my software to the guy I promised this to and or you know to my parents um, but in the end how do you get there you've tried going super fast and, and hack it out. Did you get really far with that? Uh, chances are that you didn't. Um, so we'll talk about that in just a bit as well. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm a bit all over the place. There's plenty of concepts I kind of want to uh, get across to you and it's just kind of uh, fluffing into the same sort of like weird blob. <laughs> so bear with me. It'll make sense by the end. <laughs> Again, software crowd. Apparently there's another title. Um, so that's how I remember. So, so this message, the previous message, that's sort of like one of the cores of, of software craftsmanship. How it's done is as important as having it done. So keep that in your mind. Try to think about that uh, while we delve into uh, further concepts. So let's talk about what software craftsmanship is not. Uh, because now you have a weird idea of like, is it just like a feel good thing? excuse for me not to do my work <laughs> it's like yeah yeah no 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 no. i know it's not done boss listen i know it's not done but the two methods that i wrote that don't work by the way are super easy to change bro and they like like they're re i did them in the you know i i wrote them in the best possible how i could um that's not exactly <laughs> so that, that maybe that's your mental image of it so Let's let's say let's dispel some of the um, some of the things you might think this is, but they're not. So number one, it is not beautiful code. What Peter? What? Isn't that the how? 
Isn't that the how that you talked about two slides ago, right? Me looking at the Visual Studio and seeing this is a beautiful class. Isn't that how? Well, nope, it isn't. So it isn't beautiful code. Um, it also isn't test-driven development. What? What? But Peter, I use test-driven development and I thought this it was the right thing to do. Well, we will talk about that in just a second, but, it, but software craftsmanship is not any of those two, right? Keep that in mind. It also isn't an elite group. That's this big brain. It's not like, oh, I'm a, I'm a software craftsmanship and you're just a lowly developer, right? Uh -huh. Or if you want to become a software craftsmanship, you gotta like apply here. It's really not. It isn't. <laughs> so stop thinking that <laughs> it's illegal. It also isn't any specific set of technologies or uh, methodologies, right? It isn't React. It isn't .NET. It isn't Visual Studio, right? That is not software craftsmanship at all, right? None of that. It also isn't a certification. It's not like you apply here, you you know answer a set of questions, and and you just get a certificate that says you're a software craftsman. It isn't. Th see, that's a that's the difference between like something like uh, a Microsoft MVP or uh, any other certifications you might get from like Cisco and stuff, um, and uh, software craftsmanship. Right? It's a term for a for a set of ethics, really. Right? For priorities. For um, the how. Right, we're trying to defy the how. Your ultimate, don't get me wrong, your ultimate goal re still is to get you know, the, the project done and finish uh, that piece of software, but it's very important how you do it. And there are you know, easier ways of doing it, by all means, but also uh, ways where you're gonna generate the most value, value for yourself as a, de as a developer, as a person, uh, with a passion and a and a, a life purpose, but also value for uh, the people using the software, other um, your, your other community members, and so overall, um, I lost my train of thought. That one overall, overall, uh, it also isn't a religion. Yes, ah, it's not like oh, software craftsmanship is the only way to do stuff, and if you don't do it, you go to hell. You don't. Well, you go to a different hell. Uh, you go on like hell on earth, right? I, and even even while being a software craftsmanship, we are all in hell. I'm in pain. I'm going to drink right after this presentation. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so now we sort of know what it isn't. Interesting. So what is it, Peter? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Let's. I'm going to ask you another question. How do you know that the software you write works? Ooh, it's a good one, um, Peter. I know it doesn't work, because um, it never works. <laughs> it never worked. <laughs> Good, all right. Um, let's say you write a simple uh, Minesweeper application or, or maybe even like a simple Hello World, whatever. How do you know it works? Well, I run it, Peter, and it outputs Hello World, so I know it works. Um, okay, that's a good strategy. Um, how do you know it really, really works on other people's machines and stuff? Um, well, it's difficult. Uh, you can't really prove software correct. Uh, we've been over that. We've tried that a bunch of times in all the different uh, fields. Um, I believe it might have been Dijkstra, or I'm just misremembering stuff that tried with uh, Lambda cal Calculus. Um, it doesn't. You cannot prove a software correct, uh, or maybe you can, but no, you cannot. <laughs> um, the only thing you can do is prove it incorrect. How do you prove your software doesn't work? Well, you can run it, of course, and see that it doesn't work. Or you could have a set of tests, right? A set of unit tests, automated tests that you just run and see that they fail. And oh, now I know the software doesn't work. Uh, but you can't prove that it that they that it does work. Interesting. If you know if you know any other interesting, beautiful ways of uh, knowing whether your software does work, absolutely feel feel free to uh, comment down below. Always interested uh, in what other people think. Um, so okay, interesting. Let's let's have another interesting question. Here is a situation. Uh, you have two drives, 
don't think about the logistics of this. Um, this is a fairly silly situation, but on your C drive, you have a uh, you you have a set of unit tests for your project, and on your D drive, um, you have the source code. Now, oh no, one of those drives gets corrupted. Co corrupted. Which one do you hope survives? So, which one do you really really need? Now, we're going to assume a set of things that might not be um, obvious. If it's your, if it's like, uh, if it's the, the sort of test suite, uh, a set of unit tests that we're all familiar with, uh, like the ones that I write on my streams, or uh, the ones you might write, or most teams write, then those are useless to begin with, <laughs> really. Um, well, they're not completely useless, but they they don't give you the type of uh, advantage you would you would want. Let's assume we have a um, hundred percent code coverage, a great, well maintained set of unit tests, so well maintained that well, if you run them and they all go green, you know you can deploy. And if you make a change, and you run all the unit tests and they go green, you know you didn't break any features. Okay, in that case, you might think, I don't care about the tests. I care about the source code. What if the what if the application, well, we've been working on this for three years. I'm not gonna redo three years of work. Are you nuts? Of course, yeah, I hope the source code survives. Well, let's think about it. What happens to your source code if you lose this type of uh, unit tests? Okay, well, you still have the software running, so maybe you didn't lose your job, and maybe you can quietly uh, start writing unit tests. But how do you do that? Well, it's going to be easy easier to write unit tests for this type of software because you know the code is testable, right? It's been tested, therefore it already is testable. Um, however the project continues forward. And while you're trying to put the unit test back in place, the project continues and you need to write new features. How are you going to write new features without that test suite? Okay, well, you can just hack it and hope that you didn't break anything, but you really don't know. Um, and if you continue doing that, you slowly switch back to basically a general <laughs> software project where the unit tests don't mean anything because whenever you write one, it goes green. Well, of course it goes green, but you don't know if is it a false positive, right? You would never know. Eventually, you get into a place where you have a software that is hard to change, even if it if it works at this point. Uh, and don't and don't get me started on the the fact that the code that you write from that point might not even be testable unless you still follow test driven development. Um, what you really want. Um, maybe, I mean, hopefully, what you really want is to the the unit test project to to survive. And I look, don't don't just don't don't blindly believe me. You know what? Go and try it. If you have a project that has a hundred percent code coverage, if you're not, you should probably <laughs> you should probably just make one, something simple, whatever, like like a kata, and then delete the source code. Only leave the unit test. Try to fix it. Um, you'll realize that it's not difficult to do. You run the tests and they fail because the source code doesn't exist. And the test says, I cannot instantiate class game because it doesn't exist. Okay, so you create the class game. It says, well, I can't call method make move because it doesn't exist. Okay, so you make it. Well, the method doesn't return what I thought it would. Okay, so you make it return that. Oh, yeah, but like when I pass this into it, then it should return something else. Oh, so you do that. Piece by piece, you can recreate the source code. Maybe not exactly to the point uh, where, where it was before the deletion, but functionally identical, right? You're effectively going to full refactor the whole thing, refactoring being changing the, the structure of the code without changing the behavior. So you're going to keep the behavior. Interesting, beautiful thing. I think we should try that in the next video. Just uh, pick a piece of software, delete the source code, rewrite it based on unit test. That'd be kind of cool. Um, well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about, but let's talk about what software craftsmanship is. And I mean, this is like 
a weird sneaky way I'm like implanting <laughs> cool things into into your brain. Um, I know, uh, I know that was like a weird segue, <laughs> but, but hopefully it'll make sense. So let's talk about software craftsmanship as what it is. It's in in its core, apart from oh how it's done is as important as having it done. Um, it is about two things. It's about professionalism and responsibility. And I can hear people getting up or closing the tab, being like, ah, oh, fine. <laughs> uh, no, 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 bear with me, bear with me. Let me explain these things. First of all, literally, like, like actually look at it. What is professionalism? Try to define it, it's difficult. It's really difficult to, to define. Responsibility you kind of could sort of describe, right? But professionalism is really difficult. Um, I urge you to just yeah, just think about it, try to define it. It's pretty hard. Um, you might say, but Peter, I'm not a, I'm not a software developer by trade, right? Like I'm not, I don't work for a big company. I don't work for any company really. I'm not paid uh, to code. I'm just a, I'm but a humble Node.js developer uh, who writes cool apps uh, on you know in my spare time. It doesn't matter, right? Um, this isn't something that only applies to uh, professional sort of developers. Maybe that's your defini uh, definition of professionalism. Oh, you're getting paid for it. That'd be a rough definition. Uh, I don't think that really encapsulates the, the entire thing. But um, even if you're just uh, contributing to a random open source repository or you're building the next Discord bot for your friends, you can still apply these two uh, sort of pillars. You can still be a professional in the way you build it and take responsibility for it, right? Responsibility could be in many different ways. So we're going to talk about plenty of them, even about professionalism. Um, taking responsibility, someone who's responsible cares, right? Ideally, I mean, unless they're, <laughs> they're responsible for something horrible and then uh, you know they, they didn't care, but they they put their their skin on the line. Is that what would you say? Whatever. Um, you know what I mean. Hopefully, you get you, you're starting to get this this feeling of it. The, the this feeling of ownership. Let's talk about professionalism in a professional setting. So, if you're getting paid uh, to write code, keys, because I feel like that's one of those um, cases where this applies probably the most. So here, this is not what a software development team looks like, all right? We're not just, you know, people in a factory. Um, I just cannot even look at them at this point. I'm just, now I feel judged. It's like, <laughs> this guy in the back, the angular guy, I like how he's like, just chuckling. <laughs> he's like, haha, you didn't know what dependency injection was. Well, guess what, buddy? <laughs> um, all right, so we are not, um, you know, people in a factory. Um, it's not like a nine to five where you sit down, you start coding and you know, it's 5 p.m. You stand up and get out. Oh, but like the production bill doesn't work. I, I don't care. I work till five. That's really not uh, not what a professional uh, does. Um, of course, this is like a bit of a hardcore case, but um, a more common case would be, well, if it's not code then I don't care. I don't care about the business. I don't care about like what you're trying to do. I'm being paid to write code. So you tell me what code to write and I'll write it. Well, that, all, that also isn't professional. Uh, the mentality of if it isn't code, I don't care, uh, isn't quite uh, professional. And and I, I don't, don't even like, it's not something like I need to tell you. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can sort of like instinctively sort of feel that right like oh that you wouldn't call that person a professional right uh by a certain definition right depends on your definition again and i'd love to hear yours um by the way this guy oh no oh it tries to do sorry uh can i make it full screen again oh there you go by the way the, this guy <laughs> i can feel his pain i can feel it all right let's look at code we're developers, let's look at code. What do you think about this code? Ooh, 
Start screen shake, mm, some floats. Who knows what those are? Oh, those aren't all floats. Two floats and two integers. Interesting. Um, who knows what these parameters are? If you're, if you've been reading maybe clean code or you've been around code for a while and you have your set of standards, you could, oh, you could be like, oh, that's, that's just bad, right? I don't know what it is. Um, those uh, parameters are just meaningless to me. Uh, they, you can't derive what it is from the method name. And you could be like, well, you have three identical for loops. What are you doing? Also, there need to be a, there needs to be a space between like you know the less than sign and uh, the the six uh, literal. Uh, and you can come up with and the indentation. Look at the indentation. Merge the for loops. Unindent it. Right. Um, also, these two add prop forces are basically identical with a different first parameter. What are we doing? Right. What are we doing? Um, indeed, the last line summarizes it, <laughs> gives sanity damage. That's about right. So interesting. Let's, uh, so now that you've seen the code, just, I'm going to give you a tiny bit, you know, think about it, look at it, look through it, think about what's going on. Okay, fine. Now describe the author of this code, right? Mm. Does this person care? Is this a professional? Um, is this their first attempt? Maybe they just don't know the language. Maybe this is the first time they're, they're, you know, experiencing it. Maybe this was generated. It's not even like nobody actually wrote it. <laughs> maybe this is just copy. Maybe it was copy pasted. Interesting. If you have any other descriptions, by all means, absolutely. Uh, I would urge you to, to write it down in the comments. Well, it is easy to say that a piece of code is badly written. It is easy to complain or even laugh. Ah, ah, ah. But the question is, are you good enough to make it better? Ah, I know, ooh, one of those Instagram posters. <laughs> ooh, just add a, add a picture of a sunset behind this. I mean, like, ah, yes, moral high ground. <laughs> I like it. In other ways, you can rephrase it to, I'm not stupid, you're stupid. It's a bit big no you to criticism. <laughs> um, <laughs> but of course, that's not the message. That would be a gross misinterpretation of what this is saying. What this is really saying is, if your first answer to describe the author of this code was, oh, that was a stupid person, that was a, a complete amateur, maybe that's not constructive, right? Maybe a better option is, oh, okay, so let's let's come up with easy ways of fixing this right right now nobody you don't need to laugh you don't need to get blame it see who did it um you can just um just make it better if you look at a really bad piece of code that's easily refactored bro that's free elo you can just do it bam free exp hey you know and to just laugh at someone well is that professional if you just laugh at a JavaScript programmer for writing a weird function, or even the .NET, whatever, any developer, why am I picking on JavaScript? Uh, is that professional? Hmm. Probably not, man. Well, first of all, the code was mine, so fuck you. <laughs> I, I wrote that, and I didn't write it intentionally as well. It was, um, ooh, that might have been like, 2012, 13, I was very new writing uh, <laughs> Amnesia custom stories, uh, modding Amnesia basically, yeah. So screw you, <laughs> no, you're bad. <laughs> All right, well, so how do you improve as a craftsman? How to be a better craftsman? And it is not by uh, getting one of those sewing machines. Um, now I like this guy just turned into what like a like a clothing manufacturer. I don't know what he's doing. In the meantime, we were talking about code. The guy just picked up and just making a jacket now. Uh, whatever. Uh, he's he's a cool guy. Also, 
if this is his left hand and he no longer has his ring, he probably got divorced in the meantime as well. Because <laughs> I, I seem to remember he had, he had like a, a wedding ring. May, or maybe he just takes it off to do dirty work because <laughs> he's like really upset about it. It's like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, be married when I'm doing this job. <laughs> or maybe this is his wife. That's even a bigger plot twist. I'm sorry. I'm going to continue now. <laughs> so how do you improve as a craftsman? What can I do to improve? Number one is humility. Um, I think that's something that, you know, we all kind of need, right? Um, there's plenty of arrogance around and uh, some of it is misplaced. Um, there's also a lot of elitism and, uh, you know, competition type of um, environments. Uh, I'm not saying those are bad and should be completely abolished. I definitely can see, um, I mean, you, you also do, uh, to, in order to grow, we also need an environment where you're going to be challenged, right? And after a certain point, the type of challenge um, you, you require might be, and if you, depending on your personality and the way, if you're a very competitive person, um, then by all means, maybe that's exactly what you need, like a lot, like a really harsh type of boot camp. Uh, <laughs> environment of coding but in general i think we can all improve as craftspeople by eating a piece of that humble pie right just you know calm down you don't know everything and that's okay it's okay man you're not a you're not a worse person because you don't know a, an ef core you know uh, API for joining three tables together. You're not a bad person because of it. You're also not a bad developer for not knowing it, right? You're just a developer. Nobody knows everything, all right? And if they say, if they claim to know everything, they're lying. And and maybe it's true today, but tomorrow they're not going to know everything because the line is moving away from you, right? This is a uh, beautiful uh, thing I sort of heard recently, and that's the about, about the mas mastery curve, right? Um, if you think about it, you will never reach perfect. Uh, can I draw? I am sorry, I'm going off the script now. Look at this. Oh my. If you take this as time, oh, this is brilliant. And this as, <laughs> oh no, what, what happened there? Thanks, Microsoft. Um, so, so this is time, T. And this is uh, like skill mastery, right? And this would be like knowing everything, right? You start here and it is a curve like this. Look, you will never, you will never actually get there, right? And an interesting fact there is that when you're here, right? In this amount of time, Ooh, you grew a lot. You went from here to like here. Ooh, that's a big increase. Ooh, that's that's quite a lot. See, I even drew this intentional. Absolutely. What about here? You've been here for a while. The same sort of distance, maybe even further. You didn't. You increased from here to, to like here. It's just tiny. The difference is tiny. Worse still, um, this line is moving up probably even to the right, I don't know. Uh, it's moving up every day. So you literally need to learn a lot just to stay still, right? And that's why, you know, and that's why just lulling yourself or lying to yourself um, into believing that you know enough or you know it all is a gross misunderstanding of the entire field, right? Like that's not, and e even if it was true, right? It's not going to be true forever. How do I get rid of this eraser? Microsoft, please help. Laser pointer, yeah, that'll, that'll do. Oh, please, come on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, this is why I use Visual Studio and not a goddamn presentation tool, all right. Okay, so <laughs> number one, humility, sorry for the tangent. Number two, ecosystem of learning. Okay, so first first thing I admit is, well, I don't know everything, right? I might know some things really well, but definitely know very little about other things, right? Well, let's build an ecosystem of learning. Let's um, help each other learn. 
what is an ecosystem? Ecosystem is uh, this concept where things contribute to each other, right? It's a, I mean, you know what an ecosystem is, right? And I'm not the best person to describe it. Um, what it basically means is teach and get taught. <laughs> teach and learn probably, right? <laughs> um, not to mention, um, when you're when you've been past like like if you're like maybe like on that sort of plateau in that curve, eventually in order to learn effectively, um, you gotta teach. And I'm not saying oh start a YouTube channel and start like making videos. Although if you have that inkling in you, then absolutely go for it. Uh, but some people don't like it. Some people actually don't like even public speaking. It could be something as little as. Oh, just um, during a code review, explain something, right, in in a friendly way. Not like, oh, you dumbass, you should use dependency injection, learn, learn. <laughs> um, more like, you know, it is a bit of a bit of a so, so, sorry, soft skill in there as well. Um, you could you could pair program with people, right? Learn from them, teach them something as well. Not. It shouldn't be like your goal, but you should be very much open to it, right? Or just go talk to developers. Join our Matrix server, right? We just talk. Even that is just an ecosystem of learning, right? Uh, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, if you combine that with humility, you're going to sort of uh, increase your, your learning curve, right? All right. I genuinely don't know what's next. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, so what can we do? Like practically to actually get better. Um, one of the ways to do it is katas. Kata is a, a short exercise, a repeatable exercise as well, uh, that you can do maybe within uh, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on how complex uh, the kata is. Um, basically, um, you could see it as uh, like, oh, write a simple application in whatever language you want, uh, where if I give you a string, you're going to extract all the numbers from it. And that's the kata. Cool. You can do it. You can do that. You can probably do that within like whatever. Some people can do it like oh, within uh, five minutes. But uh, even if it takes you an hour or whatever, it's still a really nice exercise. What if you do that every morning? Well, beer, I already know how to solve this. It's stupid. If after I do it once, it's useless to me. It isn't. Why? because it represents actual development. Maybe you use that kata that you know how to do in that language to, well, first of all, learn another, a different language. Interesting. Or you could even use it to learn a different IDE. Ooh, I've heard Vim is cool. Mm, I'm gonna, what should I do? Should I just switch, you know, and, and uh, use it for my big giant project where I, even though I don't even know how to exit it? No. You, the best way is to, again, just go for a kata, do it in Vim, do it in Rider or Visual Studio, VS Code, Eclipse, whatever. Interesting. Uh, and then maybe you know what feels right. Or you could, uh, you know, use it to practice uh, TDD, right? Tester and development. Very good, right? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back a little bit to a point I had previously about uh, software craftsmanship not being TDD and not being uh, any methodology or language. Just like that craftsman isn't going to be like, bro, hammers, they're like, cool. And we only use hammers, hammer gang, you know? <laughs> Screw those saw people. They, all they know is how to cut stuff. We build stuff, you know, with hammers. Uh, that's, uh, that's, of course, not what he does, right? Like, he knows a bunch of tools, and he uses the best one for the job, according to his judgment, of course. And the best one for... And, and the best also uses the best techniques, right? So, yes, while it is true that currently a way to stable, repeatable releases is through test-driven development, it isn't a definition of the mindset, right? If there is something different, if there, if we find a different, better technique, oh, we're going to drop TDD, we're going to do that. Makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. 
Um, it's also part, it is, I think that that summarizes it really well. It is the mindset, right? Uh, and of course, one of the things that you could practice is Git. And I have a Git Kata, a shameless plug here, uh, where you can uh, basically generate repositories in different um, states with my with a couple of my scripts. And it like simulates a merge conflict and you can try to resolve it. And if you screw it up, you just delete it, generate it again and try to fix it or whatever. Uh, there are some different merging strategies as well. Of course, it is uh, free and open source. So if you feel uh, if you feel like you have different situations that uh, you need to practice in terms of Git, feel free to contribute. Uh, you can also have pet projects. Build something cool. Build something you like. If you feel like, I mean, th these are options, right? These aren't a checklist. Um, maybe you're not a Kata person. Maybe like, you know what? I really want that, uh, you know, custom pet project where I built a to-do list and I'll be the best one though. <laughs> or I built a calendar or whatever, whatever it is, or a Discord bot or game. It's up to you. But having something of a pet project is absolutely a sort of um, a great way to improve. Contributing to open source um, is also a great, great way to improve because you're going to get the feedback and you're going to learn valuable lessons about uh, working with other people as well. If you don't know where to start, uh, we do have a couple of uh, fairly beginner friendly open source projects in .NET and C Sharp. So if that's something you want to improve at or just learn, hey, that might be a great way. We might even start other projects in different languages, of course. Pair programming is a big one, right? If you're working in a team, pair program, work together. That'll be cool. Um, you will definitely learn something even from the most junior uh, developer you sort of pair program with. Um, and better yet, if he's on your team, then you're going to level him up to be a great engineer. And you want great engineers on your team. Or if it's uh, pair programming, doesn't have to be just in a team. It could be with a friend, with a mentor, with a you know a cool person that you know from YouTube. <laughs> Not me though. <laughs> Actually, me too. Fine. Um, use it to learn something new and open your mind to different approaches. There you go. G well said. PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, then of course deliberate discovery. It is true that you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so you you have to go out and look for it. Uh, for example, you should probably look it up. I don't have a link for it. There's a tech ra radar, technology radar. Um, it's a beautiful, I think it's a website, but they also release, I think, twice, maybe four times a year. Um, they release like a huge sort of um, list. It's organized well. It's like actually even like in a, in a radar little graphic of all like the new and latest uh, or actually applied and, and used uh, technologies and, and frameworks and languages, right? So, hey, you know, actually go looking for it because you don't know what you don't know. And then if you realize, oh, actually, you know what? I didn't even know there was a language called V. I, I don't know anything about it, but now at least I know that it exists, right? And now, now I sort of, if I only know C family languages and I know most of them, I'm like, oh, I know most of the stuff, right? I, I'm like, I basically know everything about engineering. Yeah, but like only because you don't know that there are functional languages, right? Or stack based languages, right? Like you don't even know. Um, and that's why you might feel like you've hit a brick wall that there's nothing else to learn. No, you got to look for things to, to, to learn. The biggest mistake that the software professionals can make is not accepting that they don't know what they don't know. Okay, fine. <laughs> you got to accept it. Thank you, PowerPoint. That's what I said. <laughs> All right. See, interesting. People would say, but I don't have time, Peter. I don't have time. I don't have time because I'm watching YouTube videos and playing video games and, and drinking. I'm doing a lot of drinking, Peter, you know, I, it, it hasn't been, uh, you know, time has been rough, man. 
And uh, no, 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 okay, I'm gonna stop you there. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. Fine. Um, you need therapy as well, by the way, but not a that's beyond the scope of this video. Um, time should never be used as an excuse for not doing certain things ever. We all have time. This is, a, this is, by the way, not my quote, right? So please don't bully me. Um, probably should have, uh, should have actually attributed it to whoever said it. Uh, now it's a bit too late. This presentation is a bit old. <laughs> In fact, we all have exactly the same amount of time. The difference is how we choose to spend our time. Of course, we're not talking about like, oh, you, you're gonna get hit by a bus tomorrow and therefore you don't have as much time as I do because I'm not, because <laughs> I'm not going out. <laughs> um, uh, we, I mean like in a day, right? Um, and even then it's like, well, it's not my choice. The difference is how we choose to spend our time. Well, I don't choose to spend my time in jail. They caught me. <laughs> um, or I've got kids, bro. And I don't, well, you do choose to take care of your kids. I'm not saying don't take care of your kids so that you can be a better software engineer. <laughs> that's definitely not what I'm saying. Uh, although, yes, do it. It's, um, there you go. That's, uh, that's the life hack, bro. <laughs> uh, you know what this addresses, right? This addresses the procrastination game, right? Um, yeah, I, I guess it is for everyone to, to sort of judge on their own. Uh, think about it for for your of course everyone's situation is going to be different so this isn't going to apply to everyone but but just like if you if you if you use time as an excuse though um yeah it's uh, it's not a really valid excuse unless you have like really concrete uh, problems there <laughs> again what can i do to improve apparently oh yes what can i do to improve i like this i prepared this bit all right what can i do to improve books Books, books, it's slower. Uh, no book, these, these books, those books, no books, notebooks, get it? It's funny, because I, pr whatever. It didn't have that much of a punchline because I couldn't, c couldn't, you know, flip it fast enough. The, the fade in got me. Uh, but it was funny, whatever, just chuckle or exhale out of your nose. <laughs> Fine. Um, if you're into books, these are the, the books that I would recommend. Of course, The Pragmatic uh, Programmer, The Mythical Month. Uh, of course, Design Patterns. Oh, that's a good one. Um, a lot of people say that they don't uh, need this, these design patterns in uh, their favorite programming language. Doesn't mean you cannot learn it. Also, it's not true, you still need it. Test Driven Development, beautiful book. Extreme Programming. Clean. I like Clean Coder, Clean Code. There's Clean Craftsmanship as well, so if you want a set of uh, ethics absolutely go check that one out it's fairly new maybe like two three weeks ago released by uh robert c martin uncle bob really good stuff um anyone without any exception especially new developers should read the art of readable code um i think that's one of the nicest easiest to read books it's also free online so you can find it uh, the author released it as a PDF. It's not like I'm getting you to download books illegally. Um, refactoring, of course, and software craftsmanship. That's uh, Those are uh, really important books. You can also do other stuff. You can have a, uh, you can read or have, uh, you, can, you can read different blogs, uh, follow people on, on Twitter, uh, join online communities such as our community as well, uh, or even just get a find a local user group, right? Like actually meet up with people in your uh, in your town or community. Or if you're working, it could be a community at work. It's probably better if you're working in a software engineering field and not like a, you know what, wherever in a grocery store because I don't know how many developers you're gonna find there. A good question is, should your employer pay for your learning? Is it their responsibility? Uh, well, would you pay for your lawyer's training course? If it's gonna get me out of jail, yes. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, maybe your plumber's training course, right? No, I'm just gonna get someone who knows, right? So maybe your, um, 
employer shouldn't be responsible for that, right? That's your your responsibility to take care of your career. Now, if they do, if they do actually pay for your courses and books, that's great. That's great, but that's should that maybe shouldn't be um, what they uh, their, their responsibility really, right? Um, again, feel free to voice your opinion on these things. Another cool thing is automation. Um, that's how you get better. Um, I don't know if you, this is like a bit of a weird point for sure, but, um, you could save up a lot of time with super small things. You can write a batch script that you run that opens your browser and automatically opens all the different uh, websites you always use, like MSDN, uh, DuckDuckGo, right? Or Stack Overflow and GitHub, right? And you save a tiny, tiny bit of time, but it adds up. Of course, automation on Windows is gonna be a bit more difficult than on Linux, but hey, um, it's still doable. You could have hotkeys for all sorts of things. You could improve your, um, workflow you know iterate on your workflow itself maybe this id isn't the best choice you know what i mean or oh maybe i should try um th this cool little automation tool or something similar <laughs> so yeah absolutely automation is a uh, sure way to improve as well or save time that you can then spend reading books now I think it's our responsibility to ensure the application is easy to maintain. For that, we need to keep refactoring and improving the design. The only way to do that safely is to have a full test suite. We should follow TDD, says a developer. Sorry, man. I don't think it's going to happen. I have no interest to rush or make things better. In fact, I don't really care. And for your information, the client doesn't care either. This is just a job. I have a life, um, read League of Legends. And I don't want to get stressed out thinking about this stuff. Just relax, man. I'm gonna hurt this person. I'm gonna hurt him. I'm gonna hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what you do. You don't attack people. You don't assault them. What do you think? Uh about this situation. What do, you, what do you think of it? Bad. Attack him. Fire him. Or maybe you're the type of person who's going to say, oh, okay, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Um, you lead by example, right? Insert a cool montage where you single-handedly write all the unit tests and then victoriously come back into the office with all the unit tests and you go here dumbass <laughs> i got them all and then he hangs his head in shame and <laughs> walks away now granted that's not gonna happen <laughs> but what you can do uh no that's uh oh no actually that's part of it i'm pretty sure you can lead by example we're gonna talk about how to do that it's really annoying complains a developer I would love to do TDD, but no one else in my team wants to do it. It's just like it's like a it's like a follow up of the previous situation, really. This is an excuse, really, not the attitude of a of a software craftsman. Um, don't complain. You know why would you complain about it? Have your just do it. Write write your own tests. You know if nobody writes unit tests, you do. If nobody allows you to commit them into your repository, you have them outside of it. Because you know what the best practice is, and you know the benefits, and so you just do it. And if they if they tell you, no, never write unit tests, it's a waste of time, then you do it secretly. <laughs> Hopefully, if you... I mean, of course, we picked unit tests as an example, all right? Don't take it as like, oh, this is... Um, this Peter guy, he like shills for unit tests. Oh, he's, he's such a zealot, am I right? <laughs> um, it's just an example because it's actually, uh, it demonstrates nicely uh, the, the sort of attitude. Because if you know, because you practice, because you learned, if you know the benefits of it, you, you trust them, you believe in them, and you have them sort of tried it, tried and tested, right? You do it. You do it. 
because eventually the benefits are going to be obvious to other people as well. You can, if they're willing to learn, right? If they're like, oh, I've never done TDD. Um, is that is it really that good? Then yeah, by all means, you sort of convince them by uh, giving them the, the information that you have about like, uh, you, you heard it in the first example. It's like a continuous improvement and fearless refactoring type of argument. Um, you can you, you, then you can convince them, but if someone who's like who absolutely tells you, no, it's stupid, and they don't give you it, and they really don't explain it. All right, they don't just explain it. TDD isn't is like a hammer. You don't always like go looking for nails. You have a problem to solve, and if the hammer is the best tool, then you grab it. But if not, then you don't. And if you say, oh, we should use TDD, and someone else comes by and says, well, actually, I, th I don't think TDD is going to actually help us here for these reasons. Um, I've been in similar situations, and it's not just, oh, I've been in a situation where unit is bad. But uh, it's like they actually have, oh, it's like, well, we should use this alternative. Remember, it's not a specific methodology, right? So on, uh, if you're actually, you know, if, if it's explained and you believe it and it's your professional opinion to go, mm, okay, yeah, actually, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I agree with you. This And again, takes a bit of uh, humility there as well. Then yes, but you got to have a judgment. Every disagreement isn't based on a better technique. Or it could be, right? But the guy just cannot explain and he just gets angry and calls you an idiot and, and a zealot and oh do you do bad you're a stupid boy if you <laughs> think that's gonna work um that does not provide any arguments all right that's just useless like a youtube comment section not on our channel but <laughs> on others <laughs> by all means right it's pointless um but you still do it you still do it because if you believe in the benefits uh, they are going to convince uh, people eventually May, or maybe not. Maybe maybe you're just gonna burn out and switch a project or do go do something else. Uh, that's also um, possible. Of course, not ideal, and you try to do everything in your professional toolkit not for that not to happen, but it could happen. So this uh, presentation was inspired by the software craftsman and professionalism, pragmatism, and pride by Sandro. You should, uh, Sandro, Sandro. Mancuso, I, I guess. I'm sorry if I butchered the name. Um, go read this. Uh, look his name up on YouTube. Listen to uh, plenty of uh, stuff this, this guy has to say. He's a great, great guy. Um, and hopefully, hopefully you got... Hopefully um, you're motivated now, right? Hopefully you got the ethics on your side. I want to do things right, Peter. I want to go in the world and I want to learn. I want to share my uh, knowledge with others. And I want to be a better software craftsman. And that's exactly my goal. And don't get me wrong. If it means you're going to struggle with learning Node and everything's going to be red and, and horrible, that's part of the process. It's about the mindset, taking pride in it, uh, applying what you know, and learning, learning from it, right? So please, be free, my software craftsman. Um, be free and go, uh, go explore the beautiful world of software development. All right. Um, Thank you guys so much for watching. I know this was a this was a really weird, uh, you know, divergence from what I'm doing normally. But hopefully, hopefully you guys, uh, hopefully someone's gonna appreciate this uh, at least a little bit. Um, and I will, oh, oh, of course, first of all, um, uh, feel free to voice your opinion in the comments. I'm really interested in uh, hearing what you guys have to say about that, or join our. Uh, matrix uh, group again links should be in the description um, because I, I would love for this to become a discussion right um, after all it's not about an elitist group it's not about being a zealot right it's about discussing this all right uh, is this something you identify with right is this something that sparks um, you know that, that inspires you and if it is then isn't that worth pursuing uh, what if it what if it doesn't for for which people okay sorry uh are there people 
who wouldn't benefit from it, right? That's a good question. Or, and if you are one of those, well, then um, what else could you do to maybe get inspired? All sorts of questions um, I would love to, to sort of discuss. Um, all right, and I'll see you guys in uh, another video. I can wait like nine more seconds and have it be perfectly an hour. <laughs> all right, I'll see you guys later.